Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. At million marker, we test levels of bisphenol, phthalates, parabens, and oxybenzones in your body to help you pinpoint which products are associated with high exposure to these toxic chemicals so you can balance your hormone more naturally. Many of these chemicals mimic um, estrogen, which can disrupt your overall hormone balance. And one way that your hormones can become imbalanced is due to estrogen dominance. We're going to discuss um, estrogen dominance today with Dr. Daisy Angelo. Dr. Angelo is a doctor and owner of Render Natural Wellness in Arizona. Uh, we're going to discuss the sign of estrogen dominance, how your gut health plays a role, and the ways to balance your hormone naturally. So I see Dr. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dr. Angelo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you. I'm just having to readjust my camera. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's perfect. How is everyone doing? Very, very, awesome. very, very good. Very good. Looks Thank like you for good having me today. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm very excited. This is a, such an important topic. I'm pumped. I'm pumped to be here. And I hope can be asked questions throughout as well. Yes, yes. We actually got one question before. Um, okay. Uh, before, so I added. I added. I'm going to ask you that question. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a naturopath doctor. Yes. Yeah, so I come from a family of a lot of doctors, but mostly like the conventional ND type. And I grew up with asthma. And with asthma, most of the conventional medication like steroids and inhaler, okay, sure, they work. But I was never taught, my, my mother was never taught to avoid. Mm -hmm. That was a big mm -hmm. thing. I always would get asthma attacks the day I would go to the pool. I would, I would swim and no one told her it was the chlorine in the pool that was causing the asthma attacks. So I would come home every night and she would be panicking. What's going on, my child? Giving me an inhaler, giving me steroids. And same thing the next day and again and again. So as I got older, we got to understand the pattern of the day she swims, it's the day we don't sleep. It became a thing that I could not swim anymore. So as I get older, I kind of slowly start to educate myself about, again, my disease, as well as what could I potentially do to not only limit the effect of asthma on my day-to-day -day basis, but also how to completely reverse it. Uh, so nutrition was a big thing. Exercise, I know I was told not to exercise. It's bad for asthma kids to exercise. But I've learned over time that actually exercise can be really like reinforcing to your lungs, to your heart. It's conditioning, right? So as I got older and I realized there's so much nutrition and lifestyle changes can do to ch reversing health um, concerns, I became very interested in how to notice it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this holistic approach is like so important. I think the more and more we're hearing that, you know, with the traditional medicine, mm -hmm. it's always just addressing the symptom, but not really addressing the root cause. But then if exactly. you want to address the root cause, you really need to think about more comprehensively, holistically, and integratively, which is what you, you know, you mentioned in your bio that yes. you practice integrative men and women's health. Mm -hmm. So, so what does integrative health mean? Yeah. So integrative health may mean different things to different people. For me, as a naturopathic physician, it really means adding something to your current care plan. I'm not here to bulldoze over what Whatever your MD says. Sometimes patients tell me, I want to do whatever you tell me. I'm like, okay, but it's not just alternative. I'm not here to completely replace um, your medication with an acupuncture, for instance. I'm here to enhance your life with adding new things. I'm here to educate you about what we're doing. I'm here to just complement your current care protocol. That's my approach. I like to choose the best potential herbs mm -hmm. on the market, but also the best potential, more gentle conventional prescription to also support you yeah i love this and it's almost like we uh, often talk about it's almost like a east west like yes. kind of integrative and balanced exactly. kind of thing so exactly. you, know, you can take the best from both world and then help you achieve your goal exactly yes 
so how does how does integrative health play a role in balancing hormone then? That's a very important question. Um, a few different things you have to think about. I like to consider the big umbrella of meeting the patients where they're at, right? Mm. So I pay attention to their age. That's also important as to what we're going to choose. Maybe herbs might be a little bit gentler for a 16 year old, but as we get older, we might consider like some bioidentical hormone replacement. So age is going to be number one. I also like to understand how educated are they about their health? Like how mm -hmm. educated about their disease. Some people have done a lot of research. They come to me out with like lots of notes on my body. You know more than I do, you know? So I like to know how educated they are about their condition. Also, how quickly are they wanting to reverse whatever conditions they have, their symptoms? How long have they had it for? Mm -hmm. If you have had it for a long time, it might take you a little bit, to, you know, mm -hmm. to feel better. That's going to be a really important thing as well. And how invested are they going to be? Some people just want do the lifestyle changes, you know? So you got to kind of give them the, the heavy drugs at times. But more important than anything, it's what the current medical guidelines also say. Mm -hmm. Because we have to be as safe as we potentially can. Mm -hmm. We can't just say, oh, you have high hormones. No, let's just give you some herbs. You know, we got to also see what the guidelines are saying. Are we going to do some weight and wash? Are we going to change lifestyle and then add herbs later? So yeah, I like to kind of think about a lot of different moving pieces. <laughs> so, so I think it's not even just the integrative that the service you offer. It's also personalized because that you're kind of mm -hmm. like meeting people at where they are and then figuring out what what actually works for them. Yes, yes, that's the that's the big part of the conversation we have in our, our practice. Yes. <laughs> That is awesome. So before we dive into estrogen dominance, could you tell our viewers like on a high level, what are hormones and then like which hormones are essential for like a woman, a woman's health and fertility? Yes. So hormones are little chemical messengers. We have hormone receptors all over our bodies, even like in our joints, we have estrogen receptors right there. So hormones are chemical messengers and we have what they call two categories of hormones. They have the steroid hormones and then the non-steroid hormones. The steroid hormones are going to be made from cholesterol. So eat your fats, eat your avocado toast. It's really good for you. You need fats to make your hormones. So cholesterol makes our testosterone, our estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, and a hormone also called DHEA. That's going to be your steroid. Then you have your non-steroid hormone, which is your thyroid hormone, your insulin. Maybe some people have heard of insulin or diabetes, for instance. Mm -hmm. Leptin, ghrelin, which are going to help us with um, hunger um, management. Mm -hmm. And like oxytocin is also a wonderful hormone. If you have a pet, a partner, or a baby, that bonding that you have, it's oxytocin. So you have cholesterol hormones and non-cholesterol hormones. <laughs> and okay. ask my fertility, right? Yeah. So when it comes to fertility, I would say both the steroids and non-steroid hormones kind of play together because we know that if you have an imbalance in one hormone, likely you have an imbalance in another mm -hmm. hormone. So mm -hmm. I would say maybe the leptin and ghrelin, maybe a little less, it's more hunger, but like thyroid hormone is so important for fertility. Um, insulin, if you have high insulin, maybe you're at risk of not ovulating properly. You know, the PCOS women struggle with that mm -hmm. as well. If you have too high testosterone, okay, you're breaking out, sure. That also impacts your fertility risk. So all the hormones kind of play together. <laughs> yeah, we also often say it's like your hormone system is kind of like a symphony. Like, uh, yes. So if you have your keys or instrument out of sync, that then you can't really play a nice song. Exactly. So it's really important to keep it, keep it balanced. Yes, exactly. That's a really good one. I like that actually. <laughs> So, so what is, since we're talking about estrogen dominance, like what is estrogen dominance? So what are some symptoms? Yeah. Um, estrogen dominance. I don't like that term. Actually, I want to say it. I like to look at it as estrogen excess. The reason why I say this is because I know we'll talk about progesterone later, but it's an excess. Um, we make estrogen ourselves from our ovaries, our adrenals, our fat cells, our muscles, and even our brain makes some estrogen, right? Now the estrogen dominance, sure. That's possible, but because estrogen plays well with progesterone, you have to kind of keep them at a, what they call a 10 to one ratio. So when you have a 200 of estrogen, you want a 20 of progesterone. 
when you have a hundred of estrogen, you want a 10 of progesterone. That's when you test women who are menstruating in the luteal phase, the second half of your menstrual cycle. Okay. So now the true estrogen dominance will say is when you have, let's say healthy progesterone level, but like through the roof estrogen, like in the 400 I've seen in my practice, these women are not happy. They're moody. They're gaining weight. They're super tired. They have no sex drive. Their breasts are super tender. They just feel like the That's weight of the world is on them. Yeah. That's a true estrogen dominance. So sometimes you can have healthy estrogen, low progesterone, or sometimes you can have healthy progesterone, but just way too much estrogen. That can also happen in men. If any man is watching us, men also can have estrogen dominance too. Um, they can have like a large breast. Some men will say, I'm like kind of moody lately. I'm crying all the time. I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Some men will also say they have even some erectile dysfunction, some difficulty with erections. This is all mm -hmm. hormones. So, so yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> So you mentioned that progesterone many, many times, and now we know it's really important. So what does estrogen, why does, how does estrogen dominance kind of hinders progesterone? Like how do the two kind of like work together? Yeah. So estrogen, well, we cannot talk about estrogen or hormones. That's talking about the liver. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, I know. But when you have really high estrogen levels, it's going to make a hormone, a protein, I would say called TBG thyroid binding globulin. And when that goes really high, it prevents your thyroid hormones from being used. The problem with that is thyroid hormone and progesterone play really well together. They kind of like go, they're best friends. So when you have high estrogen, not only is it going to impact your liver health, but also going to impact your thyroid health, which is going to further impact ovulation. And progesterone comes only from ovulation and your adrenals. So if you're a menstruating female and you're bleeding every month, doesn't necessarily mean you're actually ovulating every month, which is why people are like, I don't know why I'm infertile. I just have peers every month. Sure, we all bleed, but we don't necessarily all ovulate every month. So that's why it's really important to ovulate because unless you're pregnant, because progesterone comes from the placenta, common people like the rest of us, we have to ovulate to make progesterone. <laughs> Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that like both men and women can have estrogen dominance. Like, are there any like a long term problem associated with estrogen dominance? That's that's a tough one. Some women will have nothing going on at all, and then you have the occasional women who are going to find themselves maybe struggling with some potential tumors. We know this. Um, some women are struggling with endometriosis, maybe. Um, constantly having breakouts, sex drive is not great. So it's not so much right now. Okay, now you're estrogen dominant. Well, we need to fix it. It's just later. If it's not addressed, you, your body wants clean, fresh estrogen every day. And if you're constantly in excess, and you're not clearing it out every day. You're really causing your body a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. Here, here, here's the million dollar question that we got from one of our, our viewers, uh, before the IG live is, uh, what can we do to counteract, um, estrogen dominance? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, counteract it. I would say it's not so about counteracting, counteracting it. It's about clearing it out. So every day we poop, hopefully all of you poop every day, at least every two days. Um, as we are processing our hormones, we're peeing them and pooping them. So avoidance will be number one, knowing what your body is taking in. Like I know your tests do a lot of BPA, phthalates, all these testing. If you don't know how potentially you're getting those xenoestrogen, those chemicals into your system, then you're likely not going to do much <laughs> to clear them out. So once you know that you're actually getting them, now, movement is really important because our fat cells make estrogen. So women that are a bit heavier will have more estrogen than the thinner women. That's one. Um, making sure you're ovulating again, because it's the whole balance of estrogen and progesterone. Mm -hmm. Eating an amount of fiber that's going to make you go. Mm -hmm. Fiber is a really easy way. Broccoli, salads every day to kind of clear estrogen out. 
But a big thing is the liver health. The liver has two phases of detoxification. And some people are just not clearing things out solely because the liver is just bogged down by the chemicals, the toxins, the soap, the hair products all the time. So you got to support your liver first to make sure your estrogen is cleared out. Yeah, it also makes sense. Not only supporting liver during the detox process, but also maintaining the status so then you don't get extra and your liver can still like function. Exactly. And I mean, and then also you also mentioned like clearing out food poop that makes the gut also really important that the gut will actually like oh, help, yes. you know, clear out these things. So what are some things that we should do to help balance, you know, the gut then in turn to balance hormones? Yes. Gut health, um, the diet. Diet is number one. So most of our immune system is going to be in our gut. If you look at the balance of hormones and how gut health is so important, it's because of two things, liver health and just all the little bacteria in your gut. Your liver is going to take all the toxins you take in, trying to neutralize them and activate them and clear them out through pee and poop. Your gut also is going to be doing the same thing. If you're someone that struggles with a lot of constipation, bloating, you have been told you have SIBO or dysbiosis and imbalance of good bacteria in your gut, all the little bad bacteria actually make an enzyme called beta glucuronidase. Mm -hmm. And what this enzyme does, it actually reactivates the estrogen that is supposed to be taken out to be back into your body again. So Think about this. Every single day, your body is making estrogen from what I told you earlier, ovaries, adrenal, your brain, your fat cells. And now you have this bad gut bacteria that's in there reactivating what you're supposed to clear. So as the mm -hmm. day progresses, you're making new estrogen, not clearing out the old one because you're not pooping and not cleaning it out. And now you have estrogen dominance. That's why it's really important to support your gut health um probiotics if you're okay with taking them again always talk to your doctor first diet is really key and also what you're using and putting on your skin because again mm -hmm. if the liver is going to clear out all the toxins it's not going to do a lot for your estrogen if it has to work through all the drugs and all the things you're putting on your skin to also clear out so there's just so much attack on the liver so you gotta do something to help it by avoiding all the toxins first absolutely uh, absolutely um what role, because we also oftentimes also talk about mental health and how mental health also impacts hormones and everything. So mm -hmm. what role does mental health play in sort of regulating your estrogen levels and as well as gut health? Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the whole gut-brain axis. I'm sure it's a bi-directional relationship between what's happening in your gut is going to your brain, what's happening in your brain is going to your gut. So our happy hormone like serotonin, for instance, is going to be made in your gut. Most of our serotonin is going to be made in our gut. So think about like your mood, um, how anxious you are. These are all signals that the gut-brain axis is not going really well. So that also tells you that the food choices that I'm making is not making my body well. So think about the food you're choosing. You know, I always have to think to my patients, think about how healthy a healthy person would choose a meal and try to start emulating that because it's a learned behavior we have to relearn how to feed ourselves how to choose products when we go to the stores nowadays you know so think about the impact of food and how it's affecting your body i like to think about this is it healing or hurting me mm -hmm. You know, so every single thing we eat is information for ourselves. So what kind of information are you giving yourselves? And if you're going to choose the right food, you're going to have better mental health. Because you're going to feed your body with the right things. So we got to make sure we're not only thinking about the gut-brain axis only one day, but all the time. Yeah, absolutely. We also often like, I mean, it's also showed in research was people, we want people to start small, yes. but once they start, uh, you know, really acting on one healthy lifestyle behavior, uh, continuously, then other things will come too. you know, you exactly. start eating healthier. You might be thinking about exercise. Yes. You might be thinking about using better products. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's like a little trickle effect. <laughs> but I think that's like personalized approach is so important. Like you mentioned before, like thinking about where people are, do they have the time to do this? Yeah. Like what's their priority? What's their history? What's their current status? So um, what does the session with you look like? Oh, 
I always start with a discovery call, what you call, I actually call the holistic strategy consult because I want to be able to get to know you. You want to be able to get to know me. I have people coming with lots of questions and I want to be able to get through all of them. It's about 15 to 20 minutes. We discuss your current health history and I'll let you talk about goals. What does it look like for you to be your healthiest, best self possible? That's really important for me to kind of write it down to make sure we're tackling all these goals. And then we move on if it's a good fit to a 60 minute conversation to 90 minutes sometimes just to kind of get to know you, your health history. And once that's done, I'm going to be creating the potential plan that we're going to be doing. The plan may change, it often does, but just kind of giving you a timeline as to what you expect in three months, six months, a year from now, then you don't even need me anymore. That's the goal, right? So I have always available for patients. I want them to feel like they can talk to me or reach out to me at any time. My goal is, again, once you work with me, you have the tools that you can take not only for yourself, but for your family, for your partner, your kids. So I like to just educate all the time. Awesome. Totally aligned with oh, our yeah. goal too. <laughs> Education <laughs> yes. is the key for people to gain knowledge so that they can act on it. Exactly. Um, your practice is in Arizona. Do you also do virtual? Yes. As well I have seen patient virtually. I do. I do. I, I transition virtually sometimes last year and has worked really well. I have patients who travel all over the world. They can be in Italy, ask me questions. So it's been working well. I'm hoping to go back to office eventually, but right now I like the virtual. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. You, you have supplement recommendations. So how do you like decide which supplement to recommend to your patients? I like to figure out first what kind of supplements are they people that take pills or take liquids that have so many options. Um, are they vegetarians, vegans, are they Muslim or Jewish? So sometimes sometimes they have like um bovine or pigs adrenals and things. So I pay attention to that. And I talk to them, you know, like, are is this gonna work for you? Sometimes supplements replacing one medication can be a lot of supplements sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we got to have a conversation like, hey, this is going to be that cost for that long, or let's try a drug and see if that works first. So it's a conversation. I want to make sure I'm always financially conscious, you know, mm -hmm. too, because that's not also easy. And yes. I like to give them a timeline. How long are we going to be on this for? This is what I'm expecting if this works for you. This is what I'm expecting if it does not work for you. The same herb I give in to a high patient, there's that one person does not work for, and that's totally okay. But I won't know this until we try it out sometimes, you know? Right. So it's a conversation. My patients are very open. Like, it's not working for me. I want out. Like, okay, let's try something else. And we have so many, like, ideas and little things in our toolbox to help. So one herb for you might not work for your friend, but we'll try something else for you. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox mm -hmm. and then one of them obviously is our favorite is the two testing yes. um and then tell us so tell us about the the gut test the lab test that you also offer and then that you, you integrate it into your service yes i tell my patients if your body makes it we can test it saliva we can test Nerve, we can test your spit everything your stool test i mentioned beta glucuronidase earlier which mm -hmm. happens to be the enzyme that reacts with estrogen and makes estrogen dominance a problem you can test that in your stool, actually, which is so cool. I love stool testing, which tell my patient, like, okay, you're taking a probiotic. Sure, this is clearly not working for you because you have low of the good bacteria in your gut. Also, pe people like to see what the test says. Like, mm -hmm. I'm feeling all these symptoms. They're going to show up on the test, most likely, you know? So I love to be able to show them this is what's happening. These are the herbs or the medication we're going to be using to help you. And this is what we expect a few months from now once you feel better. So if your body makes it, we can test it. And I know when your company, you do a lot of urine testing. So urine testing is so effective to look at the detox mm -hmm. pathways and see how people are actually clearing things out. So I have a specific test for estrogen clearance or life clearance and allows me to tell my patients, okay, this is really a problem. We need to find out the sources of mm -hmm. the estrogen dominance and make sure we like avoid it so you don't have any problem anymore. This is, this, wow, this is uh, so wonderful. Thank you so much for what you do. And then also Thank like you. sharing all this knowledge with us. This, yeah, this is amazing. I think people really should like check out your services. And Thank also, you. Like, 
looking to like a lifestyle and then really it's taking a, like a personalized approach to figure out, you know, where they are. And then, so then we can help them because the symptom, it seems like the symptom for estrogen dominance is very, very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's not fun to just walk around and feel like, you know, not like yourself, especially in men. When men come to me and they have these symptoms, they just feel so down. You know, I was the doctors to begin with. So when they come in and they feel like they need to talk to me, I'm like, oh boy, let's go. Yeah, oh boy, let's go. And then not letting alone, like not just the immediate symptom, but also the long-term potential, like health impact with estrogen dominance is that then people should really think about uh, addressing it. For sure. Indeed. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And then thank, thank you for everyone who's joined us. Oh, and be sure to follow Dr. Daisy Anglo. And I will thank have you. all the information in the LinkedIn bio promoting this Instagram live. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs>